Now there was no evil character in this story, but it was a consequence of having uh, said to public officials, don't ever make a mistake that gets up into a visibility and we're going to have to have a hearing about it. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. You just heard Mark Murray, former president of Meyer, one of America's largest private companies. Murray speaks on his diverse experience in business, academia, and government during this interview that was conducted as part of our 2022 Business Matters Online Conference. Murray draws from his diverse leadership experience to speak on how each of us can achieve virtuous leadership. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. To conclude Business Matters 2022, Mark Murray joins us to discuss principles of virtuous leadership. Mark Murray served Meyer as president, co-CEO, and vice chairman. He retired in 2020 and remains on the board. Meyer is a major Midwest retailer and one of America's largest private companies. Earlier in his career, he was president of Grand Valley State University. He also held many roles in Michigan government over the prior two decades, including budget director, state treasurer, and education advisor to the governor. In conversation with Mark is Eric Cohn, Acton Institute's Director of Communications. You may recognize Eric from his frequent appearances as host on Acton Institute's podcasts, Acton Line and Acton Unwind. Well, Mark, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and want to welcome everybody to the final session of today's Business Matters 2022 conference. Really glad you're here. Really glad to be talking to you. I'm glad to be here. So I want to start talking about leadership in the business world. In your opinion, what makes a good leader? What qualities are most important for good leaders in the business world? Well, leadership is obviously a very big, very big topic. Uh, and I think leadership in the business community is, uh, is leadership in any community. Uh, there are some pretty uh, practical things. If you're going to uh, lead, you're going to have people who are being led or being partners with you. And for that to happen, uh, I think you have to demonstrate uh, some character. And we can get into that a little bit, what some of those character attributes are. You certainly have to have some uh, will and forcefulness to be present and to to drive things forward. But you also have to have some uh, sense of strategic purpose. Where are we going? What are the what are the, the sort of mechanics of leadership? What what do we need to do here? How do we resource this? Who are the key people? How do we really know what we're doing is the right thing? So so there's a set of work around how do we do this mechanics and a set of issues around character, but leadership is, a, is an absolutely central topic. How would you define character? Well, I think character, uh, probably the most important word's integrity. Uh, what you, you say is what you mean. Uh, what you do matches what you say. Uh, and uh, people can rely on you. Uh, leadership, people expect their leaders to be willing to push through some of the resistance that will come no matter what you're doing. Uh, and, uh, and so for a leader to have that basic integrity, I think there's some traditional attributes about good judgment and courage and justice and those kind of things that are part of that character. But if you had to put one word on it, it'd be integrity. As you look around the business community today, what do you think the state of leadership is? What do you think the state of that kind of character and integrity is? Well, there I, I distinguish two things, which is uh, the business leaders who I actually know. Uh, and I would say we're in pretty good shape. Uh, 
Uh, it's a uh, it's a demanding. It's 2022. It's a demanding world. Uh, there are uh, terrific market pressures, uh, regulatory pressures. There's all kinds of pressures, uh, and so uh, people who are up to that and are doing well uh, typically are pretty amazing people. Uh, I think part of uh, that question is business leaders in general. And, uh, and unfortunately, a little bit like what do you think of athletes these days or what do you think of others, we, we only have that as mediated through a set of social media and, and conventional media. And there uh, it looks like we've got some trouble with the business leaders. But it looks like we've got trouble with all kinds of leaders. And it's one of those things that I, I'm pretty resistant about making judgments about categories of activity or people or things if I, if I don't actually know them, because I'm not sure that I'm getting a, an accurate read in many cases. What do you think the biggest challenges are out there for business leaders when it comes to uh, putting pressure on them and challenging ideas of character and integrity? Well, a business leader will be... Uh, in any business setting will have a set of customers and a set of employees and a strategic purpose that they have to fulfill for whatever that ownership structure is, whether it's a private or public company. Uh, and so those pressures are coming in from all directions. They're a little bit different, but fundamentally the business entity has to continue to thrive by serving in essence all those groups, most of all the customers, because these are, of course, all voluntary transactions, and so we have to be providing what the customers want. Uh, markets are, can be pretty fickle. Uh, supply chains, obviously, have been a challenge lately. There's lots of issues, uh, and it depends on what business and what industry segment you're in, which of those pressures are going to mount the most. So when our guests today, or people listening, heard uh Chris Myron's introduction of you, heard your bio, hear that you've been, um, you've had leadership roles in business, in academia, and in government. I'm Given that wide range of experience there, uh, is there any leadership lesson that you've learned in one of these sectors that you've found to be less common in the others? Um, certain things that you've drawn from the business sector that you think should be more prevalent in academia or in government or uh, things you've seen in government that uh, or academia you think should be more present in the other two? I think the uh, first I'll start with, I, I, I think every segment of our common life uh, is a little bit isolated from the other segments. And I think uh, the academic community doesn't have full appropriate respect for governmental sectors and the business sector. And likewise, the business sector doesn't necessarily have full respect for the governmental and educational sectors or other, you know, healthcare. There's lots of places where we're in our own little domains uh, or not so little domains. Uh, as it relates to business, the thing about business that's so uh, attractive and interesting is how much you have to be on your toes at all times. Uh, there is a, uh, a decision, uh, I, I work in a, or was working, I'm retired now, in a uh, grocery industry. Well, people are shopping every day, every week. There's lots of driveways you can pull into. You have to be on your toes all the time. In governmental work, uh, there are election cycles, uh, but those aren't as frequent a set of choices as customers are making. Educational sector, uh, typically have an enrollment decision that's an annual decision. And it's that pace of business and the continued tuning to the, the exigencies of the moment that's particularly attractive and can lead to a nimbleness that would benefit education, government, and other and any other sector that doesn't have that immediate feedback loop the way businesses do. Yeah, how do you... We often hear the slogan uh, from politicians that they want to run government more like a business. And it's one of those slogans that I hear, and I understand what they're trying to say there. But I think we'd recognize that there's a different set of incentives 
that exist in government, that exist in academia, that exist in the business world. How do you think that can best be navigated? I mean, certainly, as we just talked about, there are principles that people who've been involved in business can understand and want to apply to the way that government operates or the academic world operates. Um, but how, how do you approach it, understanding those incentives and knowing um, that you're, just, you're never going to transform government to run exactly like a business? How do you know when to apply a principle to better something, but not try to take it too far and make one institution into something that it really just could never be? Well, I think uh, government has a critically important function about ensuring uh, order, that we, you know, contracts are valid, uh, they're public safety. I mean, some of these fundamental there is an element of government which has also taken on uh, the service for people who aren't necessarily engaging real well. So these are poverty programs, child welfare systems, there's all kinds of systems. And that's one of the things that's pretty fundamentally different about government is government is serving everyone. There are very few businesses that don't occasionally either choose not to serve a certain segment uh, you know, we, we, we're a fast food operation. We're not trying to do fine dining. We're fine dining. We don't try to do fast food. I mean, that's every people have their own. Say, well, in government, you really don't have that choice. You're, you're responsible to to the citizenry, to everyone. Uh, so that's that's a important distinction. And, and that means there are certain elements of a business plan you can't really uh, model because you have to serve everybody and everybody comes with different skills and capacities to engage you. Part of it though is where where government is running things that should look a lot like a business, you know, the motor vehicle. Uh, uh, there would be a real benefit in a fanaticism about customer service uh, that is typical in business that would help us all as citizens. And I think it would help elevate a little bit the esteem uh, that we, we would hold as a community for our governments. Uh, how that gets fixed, there's some pretty interesting budgetary questions about capital. Uh, it's hard to get capital in governmental settings. Typically, easier to get operating funds. As a consequence, there tends to be a, a diminished role for IT in government. And so the systems typically are pretty old and creaky. It's hard to do first-class customer service if you don't have a really modern IT platform. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's not without its challenges, but those are a couple of thoughts about this question of government as a business. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up Department of Motor Vehicles, right? Because that's the one that's always the joke. You know, it, if you're going to make a reference to a poor government experience, a poor interaction with the government, it's almost always people reference the Department of Motor Vehicles. And I think this maybe speaks to what I was asking about earlier with the, the incentives, or maybe it doesn't, I'm not sure. Um, I've never understood why you don't just get someone who you know, once again, who runs Secretary of State, runs the Department of Motor Vehicles, to have that forefront in their mind, to say, you recognize that everybody associates this with a terrible customer service, and we're going to reorient it to be known for having, um, if not the best customer service, at least good customer service, the kind of thing where people don't come away frustrated after having spent four hours waiting in a waiting room to get a driver's license renewed or something like that. I think it does speak to those differences in incentives between those sectors. Yeah, and it's, uh, it depends on the state, uh, but uh, at least in this state, the Secretary of State is elected. Uh, and certainly there have been Secretaries of State who have, who have run campaigns purely on this question of customer service. They've gotten in and in a couple of cases made some pretty good incremental improvements in customer service. Again, a pretty creaky IT platform. Uh, you know, we've got a situation now where uh, uh, you can do more renewal work with kiosks sitting in retail operations. That's a nice improvement. That has really made things a lot easier. Uh, with the pandemic here, the decision was made that you really can only get served if you have an appointment. And so online, and that was a little clunky at first. I think it's gotten a lot better since. Uh, I actually, for various reasons, have been in the uh, offices lately. And once you have your appointment and show up, it's actually been a very smooth operation. And so I, I think sometimes we have them caricatured. Uh, caricatures have a basis sometimes in fact, uh, but uh, 
there are certainly are examples where they have improved uh, and their incentive in the electoral world, we're the ones, we get the government we vote for. And so when people see a candidate saying they will do something and have delivered it, it's a good person to reelect. The, what is amazing to me, I moved here from Chicago and here to Grand Rapids uh, from Chicago in the middle of 2021. So I have to change my license plates, change my driver's license. And that the comparative efficiency of getting an appointment, being in and out in about 15 minutes was incredible. And it does make you think about that customer service point. And I like that you brought up the kiosk part too. You see this in grocery stores as well, um, such as Meyer, where I can check out groceries with somebody who does the checking out and the bagging for me, or I can do it myself. I think that's two different ways of thinking about customer service because you're recognizing that there are different types of customers, those that would like the assistance of someone else to check out and bag their groceries and those who just think it's more efficient if I do it myself. What, are there any other interesting innovations that you see out there in the, a different way of approaching customer service? Because I think not that long ago, we wouldn't have thought about self-serve kiosks in the same customer service sense. We think people face to face. But it, it strikes me that that very much is serving the interest of a group of customers, not all of them, but definitely serving the interest of a group of customers that would want a more streamlined approach. I think there's little doubt we're moving to our, our personal digital instrument of whatever that is in almost every setting. I'm, I'm struck now how often I go into a restaurant and I'm expected to scan and then get the menu on my own phone. Uh, sometimes that then leads right to the ordering. So I, I think we're seeing it everywhere. I, I, I'm old enough to remember when ATM machines showed up in banks and how quickly people moved to no longer talking to the bank teller, you know, drive through or walk up to it. Uh, but that was, it looked quick, but that really was, that was a couple decades because every bank had to manage the fact that some customers want to do it, some customers don't. In the grocery industry, very common. Some customers still want somebody else to do all that work. They're happy to do their own. So there's different, different lanes that people go down with that. But I, I think you'll see more digital self-serve in virtually every sector. I want to come back to the, the government question. You talked about order being uh, important. And um, here's where it leads into the word regulation. I think there are, there are two understandings of regulation as I see it. Uh, the, I think the proper understanding of it is um, the purpose of it is to make regular, right? So that you have the expectation that things will be similar in, in similar places. Uh, and then there is the way that we talk about regulation in a burdensome way, that it makes things just more difficult without the, the very seeable reason for it would be just better if we knew, had the expectation that things were going to be very similar across the board. Um, so with, with all of that in mind, uh, what is, in, in, in your thoughts, what, what can the government do or what could it stop doing that would help uh, businesses flourish, that would benefit society, that would make uh, things work better? That's a very big question. Uh, regulation, uh, quite important. Uh, what it really gets to is a question of the common, our, our common life together in risk management. How tolerant are we of risk? Uh, you know, you'll have a, uh, an auto recall happen because a dozen cars had some kind of fire or some kind of failure. Well, what if there's only one? Or, or do, are we supposed to wait till there's a thousand? Uh, and so that's a very fundamental judgment. Same thing with uh, uh, safety issues for consumer products. Uh, you know, a child is, is hurt or damaged in a, uh, in a, with a particular play toy. You know, does that mean they all come off? Or, you know, and so these are pretty fundamental questions that really aren't, aren't very well discussed. Our, our capacity is in common life to decide how much risk is acceptable collectively is underlies what goes on in a lot of this regulation. When you're sitting on the regulator's side, uh, you typically have a legislative uh, uh, expression, a law, that you're trying to then feed regulation into to ensure the law gets complied with. And there typically is a fair amount of gray area in there, which is why when administrations change, some tend to be 
more burdensome regulation, some tend to be a little bit lighter regulation, because within the range of the law itself, there's different uh, options there. Uh, but for flourishing a business, regularity, where you started, is absolutely key. Uh, I don't know of a good-sized organization that doesn't have a healthy compliance function. It's very important that you know what the rules are in business. And it takes a while to adjust your systems to ensure that you're in full compliance, which, again, virtually all businesses are working hard at that. There are some outliers. But developing the resources and getting ready to be in compliance with a new regulation takes a fair amount of work. Don't keep changing the regulation. Some of this is a, uh, uh, you know, how, how frequently do we revisit these regulatory questions? The longer they're in place, the more likely they are to be complied with, the, more, the easier it is to comply with them. Uh, so it's, uh, it, you know, and this can be weights and measures, this can be uh, pharmaceutical safety, I mean, regulations in every domain. Uh, and, it's, uh, and then you also have probably the other question is state, local, and federal. Uh, a lot of state and local officials are the ones carrying out a regulatory function in their day-to-day -day engagement with business. Occupational safety and health might be a good example of that. And you do get varying kinds of approaches from different entities, and their subsidiarity probably is the, is the ideal, which is get it close, they know the circumstances, uh, and get them close enough so that you can engage when you've got a, a regulatory problem. Well, it comes back to, I'm glad you brought up um, pharmaceuticals in there. So I was actually just talking about this with uh, somebody the other day. Uh, I think it was Milton Friedman who pointed this out, that they come back to the point of incentives again, that you know, if you are uh, a pharmaceutical company who's developing some drug that could be life-saving, life-extending, life-improving, you go through a whole process of getting that approved through the, the FDA. And internally there, there's a different set of incentives, right? There's you know, if you are the person who is supposed to approve these things, you drag your feet on approving something that may be life-saving, who knows about it? But if you're the person who approves something that ends up being disastrous, well, then you're likely sitting before a congressional hearing at some point. Um, I think those tensions are, are always going to exist, but we should at least be cognizant of them in the way that you brought up as well. The uh, risk assessment, I mean, the last two years have taught to me that we're all over the place uh, in the way that we assess risk, both individually and collectively. How, how do we get, if you're a business, how do you improve yourself? And, and feel free to comment on an individual level as well. How do we get better about assessing what the true risks out there are and dealing with them in ways that are appropriate, but don't go as far as I think some of our attempts to prevent risky things have gone in the last couple of years, and also don't just ignore risk entirely and throw caution to the wind. The, uh, I'm gonna go back to your regulatory for a second here because sometimes regulations around a particular industry, people, the industry itself wants the regulations maintained Taxi medallions might be an example of that. Sometimes that's for economic reasons. Sometimes that's just simply for certainty. And so this risk management, risk mitigation that individuals or businesses have to do, uh, maybe, maybe the last two years with the COVID is a, is, may give us a, a robust uh, set of experiences. I know there are now are people beginning to do some studies about uh, how many deaths there were in certain jurisdictions that exceeded what one would have expected on an age-related bat, and what happened to the economy. Uh, what a glorious opportunity if we could get some dispassionate review of what just said. We just had 50 state experiments, and, and inside states we had, we had even more experiments going on in schools and businesses and restaurants, and people approached it differently. Well, let's learn something from that because we're going to have we're going to have another one of these pandemics coming up. Your FDA regulation thing gets at a fundamental question about government, though. 
the, right, the risk structure inside government is don't make mistakes. The pain can be very dramatic if you make mistakes. My professional life started in a uh, social services agency. The place where the headlines would show up was if you were paying people welfare payments who weren't actually eligible, you'd made a mistake, or you were paying them more than they were eligible for. Error rates, congressional hearings, legislative reviews, it's an outrage. Millions of dollars being wasted by giving money to people who didn't deserve it. Well, what's the consequence of that? The consequence of that, if, if, that's, if that's the pressure that's mounting, we're going to get more and more documentation. We're going to make sure every month we get a renewal of information on this and that, details on the value of the car, all this stuff. The consequence of that, a decade and a half later, was a 30-page application to get on public assistance in the state of Michigan. Now, there was no evil character in this story, but it was a consequence of having uh, said to public officials, don't ever make a mistake that gets up into a visibility and we're going to have to have a hearing about it. I'll give you another example. Uh, I was uh, at one time the head of the Michigan Department of Management and Budget, and that included uh, responsibility for the procurement systems of the state of Michigan. In order to make even a small purchase, you had to have you know triplicate form and sign off from supervisors and all the rest of it. Uh, and so we made the decision to hand out uh, purchase cards, relatively small dollar amounts. I went over to the legislature and said, you know, we're going to do this. This is going to save us so much money because we're going to eliminate all of this paperwork for small things. Now, we're still going to have a full-blown procurement process for the large expenditures. But the consequence of that is there's going to be some cheating that goes on. Somebody's going to use this purchasing card down at the Home Depot for a personal item and not for a... And it will still... And we'll police that, but it's still going to... Well, surprise, surprise, a year later, we ended up having a problem with certain small group of employees who were making bad purchases for personal gain. And the legislature, wanted, and I was able to go in front of them and say, we told you this was going to happen, and oh, by the way, we're the ones that caught them. Uh, but this is an example of the balances of risk mitigation, cost structure, and appropriate customer service, because the employee's not being served when all they need is a hammer, and they've got to go through multiple pieces of paperwork to get that. Just go out to Home Depot and buy one. So, And the, I suppose, tell me if you agree with this, the, the incentive for business probably should be um, to not necessarily be afraid of making mistakes. And in fact, you know, the, the saying that you hear is, uh, it's okay to fail, fail early because you'll learn from it and can continue to evolve after having learned from making those mistakes. Well, we're going to go all the way back to the first question, which is leadership. This is one of the things that you, you absolutely have to uh, protect the, the, the people who wound themselves because they're pushing a little bit too hard. Now, now prudence says we're going to stay in reality. We're going to have good judgment. And so we expect that. But we can't expect no mistakes. People are going to make mistakes. And, and businesses, I, I, I don't know a flourishing business that doesn't have momentary mistakes in the execution of what they're doing and periodically strategic mistakes where they make a decision to go out into a new line of business, uh, make an acquisition that doesn't end up working out very well. Uh, so mistakes happen. It's just the, it's the nature of business and uh, business people are uh, able to manage that if they lead, again, back to leading with integrity. Let's talk for a moment about some of the biggest issues facing the business community out there. So the first two that pop to my mind are, of course, supply chain issues that we have going on now. We, we started today talking specifically about the supply chain problems, um, as well as uh, labor shortage problems. And uh, we recently had the, the job numbers for January 2022 were incredibly impressive. You still have a high unemployment rate, and anybody who goes around to businesses sees most of them have some kind of help wanted signs still up there. Um, are these the obvious answers for the biggest challenges facing businesses out there right now, or is there uh, any others that you see on the horizon, and, and what can and should businesses do to, to deal with these? 
Uh, I think if we if we clock this out for the next uh, 24 months, uh, probably the biggest issue: supply chain, uh, labor, and and the associated consequence of those, which is some fairly significant inflation. And uh, businesses are going to see their cost structures going up as they react in a labor market. Cost of labor is going up, uh, and so. Uh, what is the process of engaging your customers and what pricing power do you have to carry any of those costs out or is this going to be entirely a question you've got to restructure your business if you're going to have a bottom line that, that, that works for you. And obviously it'll end up being some combination of the two. Uh, you can do something uh, in, your, in your local moment about uh, labor. Uh, you have to make a decision. Is this? Uh, am I going to be able to attract, retain, develop talent if I focus a little bit more on the benefit system, on the flexibility about work from home, on the question of base wages, wages for people here, wages for incoming, bonus, sign on bonuses. There are a lot of different uh, levers to push. That's a pretty good example of where good judgment in the particular business you're in comes to play and those who bring the best judgment about which lever to push the hardest uh, and at what pace, that, that's, they'll, they'll ultimately end up winning as they confront this labor shortage. The supply chain tends to be a little bit more removed. Uh, you, you just can't, there's just not much you can do if you've got some uh, issue with a, a semiconductor or, a, or you know 18 day turnaround for ports in LA or whatever whatever the topic is. Uh, there, uh, to the degree you can diffuse who your suppliers are, you, you may be giving yourself a bit of an advantage without going too uh, far on that topic, but uh, this is one where probably c customer communication uh, may be key. When, when, uh, when a retailer has holes on the shelf, uh, to be clear that you know, we're going to fill those the moment we get product is about the only thing you can do. Go back to one of the things you said early, that nimbleness, the ability to uh, change things quickly if you need to. You know, if you're just the average business owner, operator out there, there's not a whole lot that you can do to change the national state of the labor market. There's not a whole lot that you can do to affect the ports in L.A. or the supply chain. But there are certainly things that you could do to uh, try to mitigate those problems as best you can for your individual business. So in a way, this, you know, these aren't great circumstances, but necessity being the mother of invention, it may be a very interesting time for people to experiment and do things differently. And you never know what they might learn about, you know, like we should have been doing something like this all along. Uh, they never would have learned that in, in different circumstances. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you are fanatic about who your customers are, if you're fanatic about who these people are who have joined you in this great endeavor to be employees, uh, generally good things will happen. Uh, you, it is, you will learn from, from both your employees and your customers. You'll have some hard conversations sometimes with your employees and your customers, but that is where innovation comes from. And it comes from seeing, being committed to making this work okay, now what do we do? And then it takes some, again, good judgment. Uh, it takes some courage. You, you darn well better be fair and truthful with your customers and your employees. Uh, but we're gonna try something different now. Let's go. I wanna wrap up with uh, a couple questions here. So you've had an interesting career. Again, Chris had shared uh, your backstory before we got started here. Um, we talked a little bit about it early, earlier in the conversation. Uh, what what have you found the most fulfilling thing in your career? And what, if anything, as you look back on it, would you say I really would do this differently? Well, let me let me start with the first one. The uh, uh, the opportunity to work with people I admire is the common thread. And uh, it's the advice I give anybody, always work for people who you admire and keep learning from them. And I've had that privilege across different sectors now. Uh, the, the job that was the most important to develop 
skills that I didn't necessarily either have or didn't know I had uh, was when I was state budget director. Very intense, complicated, had high politics and had high complexity in keeping track of money and rules and all those kind of things. Uh, and that was a terrific learning opportunity and, and it, a lot of personal development there. Uh, being president of Grand Valley State University was a just a ball. What a what a wonderful time to be involved with young people, with faculty. We have great faculty. Just a, a wonderful place. And then when this opportunity to come and work in business, uh, it, 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 it's a terrific company, family held company. It's absolutely terrific. So I've I've had a lot of good ones. What would I do differently? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I guess there are a couple times where I wish I had moved a little bit earlier from one domain to another because I, I found myself stuck where I either wasn't learning anything or I was working with people I didn't necessarily admire. And sometimes it took a little while to find a path to go go find another platform to go work in. But uh, but basically the answer would be not much of anything. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had. And, uh, and I know I did pretty well in a lot of them, so. That instinct to move on to something else, is that, is that just purely instinctual? That's just you, uh, I guess the advice there would be to, you know, listen to what, you know, you, you kind of know on the inside. I, we've, I think I've been in, you know, different of, uh, but similar situations in ways that you just feel like it's, it's time to do something different and I probably should move on. And you, you maybe you try to talk yourself out of it because... You know, making changes like that can be scary. It can be, um, it, it can frighten you and, and frighten you into inaction. So is it just being in touch with how you really feel about it and uh, not having too much fear of acting on it? I think, I think the, the fear is, the, you know, the, it does take some courage to, to go ahead and take a leap on something. Uh, I think it's really, as much as it's your feelings, it's actually your judgments. It's, it's the real review of what these things are, what's realistic. You know, we raised three kids. I'm, I'm a state employee. We're trying to raise three kids. They're in Catholic schools. So I've got to pay tuition. I mean, this is, this is serious stuff. I have a fundamental responsibility to them. Uh, so I was being prudent, and, and I wasn't being rash about making changes. Uh, but I also... Uh, I, I think you, you oh, maybe I'll take it back to myself. I, I uh, had a very, very deep conviction that it was my obligation to use my talents. And when I found myself in situations where I wasn't necessarily using my talents, that didn't just uh, disappoint me or uh, cause me to be a little bored. It, made me realize this just isn't right. I, I, am, I am obliged to continue to use these things for the common good and for you know, whatever purpose this organization I'm engaged with is, is here for. And so I've, I've always had a natural drive to uh, try and be as helpful and productive as I can. And when I found myself in a spot where I'm, you know, to some degree, just carrying on with routine, that, that it wasn't just, it wasn't, it probably wasn't even primarily boredom. It was a sense of I'm not doing what I need to be doing now. And is that, is that being in touch with what you, you feel you're called to do? Um, and that it could take on different forms at different times and may lead you down different paths. But having a sense of what, you know, you feel, as you said, what you felt uh, called to best utilize the skills that you have. Is that just, would you recommend just finding a way to be in touch with what you're being called to do in your life? Well, I, I, I had a certain formation as a young person, uh, and that formation included uh, Christian content and a couple of the most fundamental teachings were, you know, use your talent. There's actually a, a parable of the talents and the people who return with more talents, it's a pretty happy outcome, and the people who bury their talents, it's not a happy outcome at all. And then a little bit later, the story is, uh, you know, those who fed the hungry and clothed the naked, uh, that turns out to be a pretty good outcome. Not feeding the hungry, not clothing the naked is really a bad outcome. 
and uh, both of those really pretty much seared into me, which is we need to use our talents, and we need to use our talents for the good of others, uh, and and find ways to be of service. It's it's a it's it's I'm very grateful to have had that formation as a young person, and and had the wits on my better days to carry it into my adult life. Let's uh, let's conclude here. Uh, we have a lot of people listening who are business people who are entrepreneurs, who are working in businesses, who are running businesses, as well as uh, students who are going to move beyond the campus life that they have now out into the world and be those entrepreneurs, those business people. What closing advice would you leave them with for these business leaders and future business leaders um, for, you know, you could talk this year or you could talk just big picture going forward. What, what one piece of key advice would you want to leave them all with? Well, I'll go to the uh, students who are coming out, uh, which is your career will find you. you. You get up, head up, clear eyes, bring your best to whatever situation you're in, and another door will open. And it may be in the same, the same, it may be the business you start right out of school and you stay with that business for the rest of your life. But there'll always be new opportunities in that business. It may be that you move businesses. But bring your best always and new and good opportunities to use your best and to develop even more of the best will appear. It's, it's just a certainty. We're, we're all, everybody's looking for talent. Everybody's looking for people with their heads up, their eye, they're, they're in reality, they're prudent, they got good judgment, they have some courage, they've got some willingness, they've got some all those good old-fashioned virtues. Uh, just keep at it. Mark Murray, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation today. We Glad really to appreciate thank it. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody for joining us for Business Matters 2022. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Zhajan.